Brilliant. Oh, I love it. Even good and better. It tells me that we are now uh, live. Hi there, folks. Um, really great to see you. Um, I'm aware that it uh, probably take uh, people a little bit of time to uh, to come and find us. Um, this is uh, Fresh Expressions, uh, Tim Lee, uh, networker and facilitator with Fresh Expressions here in the UK. Um, I'm aware we will probably have some visitors um, today from across the pond. Um, Michael, uh, it's great to have you with us. Um, so, um, whereabouts are you in the States? Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me, and good morning, everyone from the States. I'm in, um, I, I don't want to cause my neighbor to covet um, <laughs> their neighbor's geography, but I am in sunny Florida, uh, where we just won a Super Bowl, and where Disney World <laughs> is, and we're at, uh, it's about 70, 80 degrees um, here in Florida and we have lots of beaches and stuff. But. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just sitting here looking and thinking I'm wearing a very thick jumper. You're still in a t-shirt. Yeah. Um, we've got snow on the ground um, here um, in the, in quite a lot of the UK at the moment. And we're having a, yeah, a really cold snap from the East. So I'm sitting here wow. in my little shed. <laughs> and it's pretty chilly in here. I have to confess. So. Well, Tim, I, I know we could make room for you here in the Florida conference, so you just you let me know. <laughs> oh, what poaching there it was. Yeah. <laughs> it's great to have you. So um, we're going to um, – it would be great if folks are kind of chiming in and uh, tuning in. Uh, just uh, say hello to us um, so that we know uh, that you're out there. Um, just Michael and I met just kind of before we uh, we kind of pitched up and started. Uh, and we were going with plan A. We're now on plan C. Um, so uh, we've changed what it is that we were going to do um, just because we just thought it was um, important, actually, that it's uh, that it's authentic. So it's going to be just more of a conversation. We will um, – there will be plenty of opportunity to, for people to ask questions as we, um, as we kind of go through. Um, so if there's stuff that we talk about – um, that you kind of think, oh, that's really interesting. Um, I'd like to dig in uh, a little bit more about that, or I would like to uh, ask some questions about that. Then that that's absolutely fine. Just post uh, the comments in the chat, uh, and we'll pick up on those uh, and uh, follow those through as we kind of as we kind of wend our way um, through the next hour. So yeah, if uh, if there are folks out there, just uh, yeah, drop us a note and, uh, and a comment and say where you're from and um, what it is that you might be interested in in hearing about this kind of uh, conversation um, today. So, Michael, you and I kind of got to know each other because um, you were um, you came and spoke at a, at, a, at a learning community that I was involved with for all of the partner denominations um, at, here in the UK who are part of Fresh Expressions. Um, and so we had we had some we had some cracking conversations and actually realised we hit it off, um, and we could probably cause an awful lot of mischief all over the world if uh, they let us loose. Yes, yes, amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Your kind of what's your kind of background um, and what you're what you're kind of involved with. Sure. So. Um... I, I was born in Florida here in, in Gainesville, and um, my mom was not really able to care for me. I was born in kind of the crack epidemic of the 80s, and so I, I grew up, um, you know, was adopted and went through some stuff. Long story short, I became a street kid, but this little congregation in, in my local community kind of took me in, um, loved me, told me about Jesus, nurtured me in the faith fed me through their never ending potlucks. Um, <laughs> and, and so we Methodists like to do lots of potlucks. I know that's yeah. an Ang Anglican thing as well, but, uh, so then, um, you know, long, I, I ended up, uh, dropping out of school, juvenile detention, all those things. Um, and, and Jesus, um, uh, I encountered Jesus in, in a really desperate, broken time in my life. Um, and my experience of the the church was positive. It was one of the few safe places I had when I was a child. So I went back to that, um, got mentored by a guy who is a recovering alcoholic, pastor, clergy, 
and really took me under his wing, Dan Jones, and um, showed me how to do life sober and those things. So then I felt this call to ministry. And then I started, uh, went into local, I was a youth pastor for a while. And uh, then I became a pastor. Then I became an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. So always I've served in heritage congregations, yep. but I've done this kind of fresh expression thing on the side, just instinctually realizing, hey, people aren't coming to church. So I'm going to, we're going to have to go find a way to be church with them where they are. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, and so then my denomination hired me to do fresh expressions as a cultivator. And then I started working with fresh expressions, us, the organization here in the United States. And then um, just last year I became the director of the fresh expressions house of studies at United theological seminary. Ooh. And we're the first seminary in the United States to have a, a doctoral and MDiv and lay certificate training in fresh expressions and pioneer ministry. Great. Yeah. Fantastic. And continue to be my wife and I co-pastors of a local church with a, a network of fresh expressions. Oh, wow. <laughs> How do you fit all that in? <laughs> um, very carefully and a strategically team based way. Um, guarding my time, taking Sabbath, spending time with Jesus, um, equipping our teams to do ministry, breaking out of this old paradigm that it's the professional minister who does ministry to the people and rather we're equipping people to be ministers in their own right, those kind of things. So it looks like we're doing a lot. It's really, um, I think the way Jesus designed the church is a priesthood of all believers and everybody bringing their gifts to, yep. to the table. As equals. Yeah. It's a bit like a potluck then. It's like a potluck. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So, um, and what's your involvement with, with uh, Fresh Expressions in the US in terms of uh, with the, with the team? Cause I know they, they have a team over there. How does that work its way out? Yeah. So my specific focus is I'm the director of remissioning for Fresh Expressions US. Okay. Uh, we have an incredible team kind of spread all over the country. My role is really focused on how inherited traditional congregations um, can can start to become churches that plant churches. Okay. And start to cultivate these fresh expressions from the inherited hub uh, as kind of the base. Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Fantastic. So um, I've got a copy of um, a book which you've uh, written called Contextual Intelligence um, with a guy called uh, Leonard Sweet. I know this was part of your kind of uh, some research, which you did probably, what, two or three years ago? Um, yes. Yeah. So um, so just tell us then, um, what's contextual intelligence? Sure. Well, let me start with the kind of the biblical framework and then move into um, yeah, sure. kind of where, yeah. all the research. So in, in the Old Testament, in First Chronicles 12, 32, uh, we hear about these folks that show up, the Issacharians, the tribe of Issachar. Okay. The tribe of Issachar. So, um, yeah, and please post in the chat, everybody, as you're joining in, where you're at. I see somebody in Sweden there. Yeah, where that's Anna. Anna. Anna's got a meter of snow, so uh, she's... Wow. <laughs> it's minus 20. <laughs> wow, Okay. Sorry about that, Anna. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so there in First Chronicles 12, it's a it's a transitionary time, very much like where we find ourselves today, I think. But so the transition there is from the leadership of Saul to the leadership of David. And um, David, all the different tribes are coming to David and they're bringing their different resources, assets, showing up with weaponry and people and food, supplies, and whatever. Um, the Issacharians show up kind of empty-handed, if you will, but they bring a distinct kind of intelligence. And the, the, the verse says that they, could, they had understanding of the times and knew what Israel ought to do. They could read the signs of the times and knew what to do. And that really is contextual intelligence. So it's, it's an ability to sense um, the times and based on the context uh, and carefully reading the context and, and uh, immersing ourselves in the context, um, then make uh, making decisions based on that and starting with that. So if you if you look at Judges 10, you see kind of the embodiment of this in a, in a person named Tola, one of the judges of Israel. 
And it's it's interesting there because just before Tola is Abimelech, um, and and there's a modern parallel here. So, so yeah. stay with me here. Yeah, and Abimelech okay. is a total train wreck of a leader. He's narcissist, you know, the greatest that ever was. He's killing people. He's running around. Um, and actually, he gets a whole chapter dedicated to his story. A woman drops a millstone out of a tower and kills him. And he's got such an egomaniac. He says, somebody run me through. So it can't be said that a woman, you know, killed the great Abimelech. So after Abimelech, Tola, the judge of Israel comes. Tola gets two verses and he reigns in Israel for 23 years. Um, and he's a, he's of the tribe of Issachar and just kind of quietly with humility and, and, uh, he he takes Israel through a time, a 23 year period of epochal serenity and um, kind of calm, peaceful you know, time. So there's this contrast of leaderships there that you could say this hierarchical kind of, you know, power mongering leadership. Then this shift to a more humble, um, which is embodied by the tribe of Issachar. So. All of that to say the Issacharians, they could sense the context, they could perceive the context, uh, and they were brought in to, to, to make decisions, to help Israel make decisions on what do we do based on that context. It's fascinating, isn't it, that the editors only detailed those two verses, mm. that particular kind of, yeah, that particular kind of story. So... Where does this fit then? So you've got what you've got is a biblical narrative which you you've picked up, mm -hmm. the tribe of Issachar and their kind of role. Yes. Are there any other kind of? Because I know you talk a little bit about um, one of the other tribes as well, and if you like those actually those two tribes appear to kind of complement each other in the roles yeah. which they have, which I thought was I found quite interesting actually. So just tell me about the other tribe as well. Yeah. So um, Zebulun. Um, so they begin as, you know, biblical brothers. And, and the interesting thing about um, Zebulun and Issachar, of all the different biblically paired brothers throughout the whole narrative of Scripture, from like Cain and Abel, we didn't know that, that we all know that didn't go so well, yeah. to like Jacob and Esau, and to like James and John in the New Testament. Um, they're typically biblically paired brothers are there's some some angst and some struggle going on there, right? Yep. So uniquely, these two brothers, Issachar and Zebulun, work together, resource each other in a very much a shared leadership approach. So okay. Zebulun, they're the they're the entrepreneurial tribe. They're the fishing. So it says that they mine the sea for the treasures of the sea, and they kind of resource Issachar, who's known. Um, and there's a lot more that that. Uh, research that's done to to talk about Issachar um, in later scholarship, um, that they really are the ones, the tent dwellers. Uh, and that's a metaphor for um, under the tent, studying Torah, studying scripture yep. um, and spending a lot of time, you know, uh, interpreting scripture and interpreting how the, the story of God fits into the larger context of the world. And so, yeah, it's this really cool story of these two brothers that become two tribes that work together and resource yep. each other in a shared way rather than trying to compete and, you know, kill each other. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, in the biblical picture of kind of leadership, what that looks like, then actually that's a very different kind of model to, you know, we, we talk about Moses, Abraham, um, and, you know, they are often, and yeah, actually the, what you seem to be talking about here is that actual contextual intelligence is, is often about how it is that people work together and the, un, the unusual nature in which those two tribes work together um, and what that kind of means. Because often we talk about pioneering as mm -hmm. kind of a, as a, as a, as a sing, we can talk about it as a single person and yet actually maybe we need, well, Michael Money would always talk more about teams um, and about what that means and how that works its way out. Okay, that's 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 fascinating. So just tell me then, where does this kind of whole thing about contextual intelligence uh, begin to kind of fit in um, with this? Where does where do those words come from? 
Yeah. And, and I love what you just said, Tim, because um, uh, contextual intelligence requires a collective intelligence. And it, right, it's, right. it's moving from this great man theory that's so yeah. prevalent in, in the Western church to teams of first class noticers. And, and teams of just say that teams of first class noticers. Teams of first class noticers, yeah. Okay. Who are noticing a context. And and um, when we get to the New Testament, and, and then I'll get to your, your question. Uh, Jesus, this is exactly how he teaches the disciples, right? They're walking around together as a team, and he's he's using the context to 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 teach and and this incarnational organic language to show them. You know the holy hum that we talk about in the book that there's a holy. there's a universal uh, a universal that runs through every context, right? And Jesus is saying, "Look at the flowers of the field. Look at the birds of the air." You know, and and using these parabolic story based truths, but but he's showing them to orient themselves, pay attention to the context, and he says several times, "You see the signs of the times. You see the red skies. You know that something's coming, or you see the the fig tree when it bears." So pay attention. Notice not only the context as it is, but what God is doing with it, what God's will is with it, and where it's heading. And he's trying to teach his disciples to, in a sense, have contextual intelligence, awareness um, of, of their surroundings, and then to, to base how they behave and act um, to that context. So the, the phenomenon of contextual intelligence, really, there's a lot about it in the business world and probably the best book to read on it. And I think we do this quite uh, dreadfully where we just kind of import business metaphors into yep. the church. And not not do some thoughtful theological reflection on those metaphors, but um, there's a great book called In Their Time uh, by Mayo and Nahira, two Harvard guys, and they did a massive study of uh, uh, of a century of business leaders, uh, some of the greatest business leaders. So they talk about you know C.J. Uh, Madam Walker, who created the first hair products kind yep. of line, first uh, black female millionaire. Um, that Walt Disney's in there, Steve Jobs, the normal uh, cast of characters are in there. But then they say, what is the theme about these people? Uh, and, and what they saw is great diversity in their, their charismas and their different leadership styles and how they went about things. But the one thing theme that they saw with each one of them is what they call contextual intelligence. And it was the ability to sense a context, where it was coming from and where it was going. And they were able to turn things that other people were kind of throwing up their hands and saying, these are challenges. They saw those as opportunities. And, and through their contextual awareness and intelligence, they were able to, to do the things um, that needed to be done to, to kind of mine those opportunities. So it's also about the ability to adapt something that we may learn in one context and to know the limitations um, because in the West, we love the quick fix solution, pour water and stir like, oh, that's working really good in that context. Let me just, you know, try to import it into this context rather than just starting with the context, sensing where it's going, what God's up to in it. And then basing our activity off that, we want to bring in these ideas that are maybe foreign to the context and try to try that. That's, we start with strategy rather than deep listening to God um, and, and what he's up to in his space. Uh, and, and so what, what all of that um, has, has been used in business world and all of that, but no one's really done a thoughtful theological application to the church. Mm. And what we've noticed with what pioneers do just kind of organically and, and sure. instinctually, yeah, is they're doing this, right? They're, they're the ones who are going, well, people really aren't coming to church, so maybe if I go ask people what church would look like to them, or if I go hang out in the local tavern and talk to people and start with that. Um, so, yeah. And and I suppose, because, I mean, to be able to do that takes a certain amount of kind of almost confidence in kind of who you are. Right. Where in your kind of experience where does that kind of where does that come from you know we would we would talk 
certainly here in the UK about kind of calling. Um, and you've already mentioned the kind of the priesthood of all believers, um, which is basically is Christian talk for everyone gets involved <laughs> and uses all right. of their gifts. And so it, how does that kind of work its way out? Does that make sense? I'm um, not asking the question in perhaps the, in the best way. I, this sense of um, being confident enough to do that. Where does that come from in your experience? Yeah, I I think in my experience it comes from a, an encounter with God and and um, you know the a, a deep um, uh, voice that you can't get away from that um, that God is is after us and and pursuing us and. And I think it also comes like one of the first things we do in our Pioneer Leadership Academy in Florida is we start with um, knowing yourself. So to have contextual intelligence, you have to know who you are, what your calling is, and be pretty fixed on that. I mean, pretty sure of that. Um, and so we have people work out what's your vocational dream and what is your personal mission statement? What is it that God has specifically called you? And do you know that? Uh, and are you clear on that? And then we have them work on their wicked problem. So <laughs> the wicked problem, <laughs> the wicked problem. They, What's they that? All, so wicked problems are problems that they they can't be solved. Basically, they just have this level of complexity um, yeah. that, that we give our life um, to stand in the tragic gap of that that thing that we see in the world that 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 looks wrong, that, yep. that bugs us, that that pokes us, right? And um, that we've kind of given our life to knowing that having the humility to know that we're not going to solve that problem. Um, but we can be a small instrument of God, hopefully in, into, um, the healing of that problem in the world. Okay. So some of the key pioneers, if you, uh, if you look at their, their history, they had something that was some struggle that was pushing them forward. Um, that, it was something in their, in their selves. Right. But also something that was in the context. Um, so I think that is where that confidence comes from or that, that I want to say faith or courage yep. to believe that things can be differently and to believe that God can use us in some small way to help that. And I know Mike Moyna talks about, um, this, um, that, that uh, really the the thing about pioneers is if you, if you strip away all the fancy kind of bells and whistles and the the mystery of pioneering and all that stuff and this idea that they're like this a pest you know species or whatever it really just comes down to anybody can do it because um, we're all called to do it by by God um, and what it comes down to is do you have the confidence to try. I and I think that's, I suppose that's why, you know, I suppose that's partly why I'm asking that question is, and yeah, if you like, where does that kind of come from? Because, yeah, I think we are in danger of, you know, we've professionalized um, kind of a whole bunch of stuff. And I think there's a real danger that we're in danger of professionalizing pioneering. Um, and we've made it kind of special. I, I Don't get me wrong. I think that it is, you know, before, <laughs> you know. But that actually, as a consequence of that, we've actually we've narrowed down the number of people who mm -hmm. think that they could do it. And yet, actually, there seems to be a trend here, which is saying, do you know what? If God gets a hold of you, then anybody can actually do this. Right. Uh, and, and I think what's really important when we look at Issachar and when we look at Zebulun and this whole idea of team are I don't think all people I think all people can can do the work of pioneering. And in fact, we're called to do it. Yep. Um, I think some people may have more specific gifts and a particular calling in that area. But when you think about teams um, and pioneering is done in teams, it's, it's a work of the people together uh, where all of their gifts. So when I look at my context, I have Larry, who's 80 years old, who uh, has gone to church his whole life, who... Yep. 
if you were to do like a pioneer profile on Larry, you would not say, oh, here's a, you know, entrepreneurial. Yep. But he planted a church in a dog park because he has a passion for his friends in the dog park who take their dogs and hang out and have community there. Uh, when I think about Denise, you know, she just has a passion for running 5Ks and she started a church called Church 3.1. Um, I think about Nicole, who has a, a passion for, um, you know, single women uh, and and getting them together and being able to have honest conversations around coffee. So when you think about if all of us just kind of turned our normal things that we do and our passions and our hobbies and the things that uh, bother us about what's wrong with the world, and we were we were to kind of you know, turn that into a form of church or, or form Christian community with people outside the church. Yeah, I'm with you. I think we can limit the idea of pioneering when really, if we were to think of it in a little bit different way that all people can be involved in it together, we would see the flourishing of the church across the world. Yeah. Um, Grant's, um, Stuart Nixon, I've picked up your question about uh, where can we get the book from. We'll come to that um, towards the end. Um, sure. But Grant's um, asked a question: Does confidence, tr does confidence to try, um, emerge from a culture where we create space to try without fear? Oh, Grant, that is a a, a great question. A question, and, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I I just add something. There's a really fascinating book by um, somebody called Amy Edmondson, which talks about fearless organisations. Um, and it talks about, um, she would say that the primary thing is about psychological safe space. Mm. And can you, so if you like, can you create with a team environment the ability to be able to say, um, I want to give this a go. And um, can we can we try it and not worry about exactly what Grant talks about there about failing? Yeah. And you know, so it seems to be about how can you create the kind of almost the soil of a culture which would enable that to happen? Yeah. Um, and and, and I, book is 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 that whole idea about psychological safe space again, probably fits in somewhere with the whole kind of contextual intelligence thing, actually creating that safety to fail is a key part um, of working that out. Um, and maybe because the church is in decline, then actually we become more nervous about failing mm. because we're more precious about it as opposed to thinking, well, you know, we've got no choice. We kind of we almost have to fail. I don't know what 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 do you what do you think? Um, I love Grant's question, and I think it is as you just said, Tim, one of the major stumbling blocks um, to to this work is um, we can in a in a in a scarcity mentality where we're thinking resources are few, there's failure all around us, rather than seeing things through the lens of God's generosity, yep. um, and having having a kind of a a generative approach of thinking, you know, there's always going to be enough. And how are we passing that down to those that are coming behind us? And um, we like to create a culture of failure um, with our, with our churches and our pioneers. And at my church, we actually have a thing called failure fest. So <laughs> if, if you're not failing, you're not doing this right. <laughs> like That's part of what's going to happen. Uh, and it's part of, human's story. I mean, if you look at Genesis to Revelation, it's the story of humanity failing forward with God. It's not the story of humanity getting it right and, and being successful. It's the story of failing miserably a lot and God kind of picking us up and dusting us off and saying, try again over and over throughout the whole narrative, right? Yeah. So where do we get this idea that we're going to try things and, and, and not fail? So risk aversion is is a real thing. And I think one of the, the key things for this to take place is we have to be able uh, to create in the face of criticism. And we have to have that kind of courage to do that and not let the status quo um, define 
what we try and what we attempt. That's really interesting. Grant, thank you for your question. But I, so, yeah. So if you like, it is about beginning to create an alternative culture, mm. which actually is about, about creating that culture of failing and of creating the safe space which enables people to begin to grow their creativity, their I want to try this in amongst a, a, a culture of yeah of scarcity and of lack of resources as you said yeah yeah i think that's yeah that's really interesting um thank you um thank you grant for that um question yeah um if folks have got um any more questions which they would uh, would like to ask uh, and to throw into the mix then please do uh, just uh, put those in the comments box and we'll uh, um then then we'll then, then we'll uh, we'll we'll pop those up and uh, and see some of that stuff so i just want to just explore with you a little bit something that i that i really um kind of got me thinking about this whole kind of thing about love and you write that contextual intelligence must flow from a healthy love of people and place where we find ourselves yeah and just just talk to me a little bit more about that and about why you think that is is so important in this yeah i i think in our christianity um at least in our western version of it it's very cerebral it's very intellectual it's very we love ideas we love ideas about people and particular people groups but what the incarnation about is about is not loving the idea of people it's it's immersing jesus immerses himself incarnate in the the mess and the stink and the the flesh and blood world and loves particular persons in a particular place in a particular time so the universal takes on particularity jesus of nazareth yep and i think if we're going to follow the flow of jesus life it requires us to to really get down in the mud of our context and to be with real people and have a heart for real people and love. He didn't just love particular people partic in, in general. He loved particular persons with real names like Mary and Martha and James and John and yeah. all those people, right, that he was in relationship with. And um, I think that that, that, can become a stumbling block for us in the church uh, where it almost becomes an extractional thing where we we withdraw into the life of the church and we come to this building and the, the all the significant things that happen there not minimizing those things um, but then that becomes kind of the center place of our christian life rather than what happens in between worship and bible studies and those things and what we're doing in our our daily rhythms so the the whole idea of you know the universal taking on particularity um and what if we could recover in the church uh this this posture of placefulness like knowing and loving our place and i want and that's that seems to be really interesting because you know when we've certainly here in the uk when we've when we've when lockdown has happened and during this covid pattern pandemic then actually what's happened is certainly i feel as though i've got to know my neighbors more you know and whether you agree with the kind of the whole thing about uh, clapping for the nhs on a thursday evening um, our street has done that we're usually a pretty busy street um leads into a local town um, but actually we've 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 seen people and we've met people doing that when during the first lockdown you know we i stood in the middle of the road talking with my neighbors um, and we could never do that <laughs> but we just get knocked over but again it's just this like you just said is that it's actually becoming more about the the this this street where i am Mm. um has really kind of and and so what does it look like for me to to love those people in the you know in the 12 15 houses that are immediately around my house on this street mm. um and whereas actually what we've almost done sometimes is kind of 
make people projects or make them people groups who we are trying to reach um yes and yeah 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 and i think what the 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 lockdown did to us so in a network society you may not know your neighbor next door but you you use technology to collaborate around practices and things in different places um, and what this forced us to do was to like stop take walks notice our neighborhood again oh look there's flowers here and there's yeah. this species of flowers and yeah. oh there's my neighbor hi that i have you know so there was this slowing down and this um you know forcing us into our place again and to notice it again and the kind of birds that live here and the, um and i think that so there was that dual reality of moving totally into the digital and trying to cultivate christian yeah. community there but also like knowing our place again and having to pause and slow down long enough to take in our place and to see it. Yeah. And I think, and, and I, again, I find that interesting because you talk quite a lot about it in kind of the, 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 the you, what you've called a contextual intelligence framework, which um, if you like, you talk about the second kind of part of that is about, um, is about immersion. Yeah. And you talk about, you know, you you said it earlier on as we were talking about Jesus walking with people and noticing those people in those particular locations and inviting the disciples to notice with him. And, you know, it would be, it would, well, it would be an interesting exercise to kind of do that, wouldn't it, around a neighbourhood? You know, we often talk about prayer walking, but, you know, what would it be for us to begin to equip people to notice? Mm. I mean, do you, do you, I, I'm, I'm hesitating because, you know, having been to the States, you know, everyone drives in the States. I mean, you know, how do you slow down enough to walk? Um, <laughs> and, you know, what that looks like, you know, because, I, yeah, it kind of, you know, you guys just drive to the shops, even though it's just around the block or, you know, but so that whole thing, and it seems as though walking is really important. Mm. So how does that work out in your context? In the how are you, how are you equipping people to notice? Yeah. So what, one of our FISAs is um, all about taking walks. And you're right, Tim, it's countercultural in the U.S. to take walks and notice your context. And can I just walk down to the store rather than driving my car the one mile distance, you know? Um, so helping people to think about prayer walking, those kind of things. I think one of the things that ha most people have found helpful to think about um, you know, slowing down and immersing ourselves in the context uh, is this concept of terroir. Um, and so every every wine, uh, you know, terroir is about the the different um, factors that come together in a context to to produce a a grape, right? Yep. So grapes that are produced in California with those uh, uh, environmental, you know, contextual things. There's going to have a flavor and a taste that I know this 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 has a somewhereness uh, is the word terroir a somewhereness. Yeah. So it takes us the slowing down using all of our senses uh, to taste the somewhereness of our context. And what's the what's the you know distinct um, factors about this place that make it different from other places? What what and looking for that is helpful sometimes. Um, so yeah. to not treat everything. Like one of our failures in the in, in the United States is we try to plant this McDonaldized version, the same kind of church on every corner, and in some cases we'll have three Methodist churches on the in the same like four city blocks, yeah. because and they're all very structured, very similar with maybe some little different um, you know ideas of uh, what why they're distinct from the other three. They're on the same block, um, but rather than understanding and tasting the terroir of the context and saying you know what would a, a contextual form of church look like for these people in this place what is good news for them yeah uh, and all of that so it it we're we're the way that we're practically trying to teach people to do this is uh eavesdropping 
And I know that sounds sketchy, but that, that's I, not CIA stuff, is it? Let me just, you know, I don't want us to get into trouble with the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it can be sketchy, but but it's like sitting in a place. What are people talking about? What, yeah. what is good news to them? Um, what are the conversations about? You can pick up a lot from that. Walking down your neighborhood, looking around at how people are interacting, you know, where are people gathering in community and wh what are they gathering around? Those kind of things. Okay. Yeah. Jamie's asked a question. He talked about the fact that you, they, we become notices of people. But this whole question about um, the same has happened to our neighbors is what have they noticed about us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I think is fair enough, especially if you're going to be eavesdropping on people and kind of, you know, and this whole thing about being countercultural then actually can become slightly kind of, oh, what's going on there? And does it make people inquisitive? In your context, does it make people kind of, you know, if you're doing this, does it, I don't know, what happened? What's, what happens next, you know, when, you, when you're starting to do that noticing? Um, yeah so so just quickly on the the framework um i want to say that we 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 looked at philippians 2 yep and the incarnation of jesus and so you see this kind of journey that jesus takes right and it starts with kenosis self-emptying um so that starts with that kind of self-awareness stuff and um we we use the word unlearning there because we found that a lot of people, we think we already know our context. We lived in the same context maybe for a significant period of time. So we assume yep. we have it kind of all figured out. So it starts with the unlearning. Then immersion in the context is all the stuff you're talking about. Um, yep. Noticing, uh, prayer walks, um, sitting in spaces, communicating with people, where, where that's safe and appropriate, where, where lockdown restrictions have been eased yep. or whatnot. Yep. And then the next thing is minding the gaps. So Jesus goes to the cross. And that's as we're noticing, yes, we're taking in our context, but, but we're also noticing the gaps um, uh, in our community, the fragmentation. Um, like when Jesus saw the crowds uh, and that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So he sees a need and he, he teaches his disciples to see that need, not just the context the way it is, but God's will and desire for that context and where the kingdom of God is breaking in and new creation is breaking in already. So the gaps could be between, uh, you know, racism and equality or food insecurity and enoughness. Uh, and so we're, as we're sensing our context, what we're trying to teach people to do is to see those gaps, the fragmentation. And then um, coming back to Grant's point, failure is built into this process because we know that we're going to get to a point jesus goes to the tomb yep the cross and there's a period of disorientation for the disciples so we thought we knew but now we're having this metanoia moment like we thought jesus was the one but he ended up on a cross so we're going back to emmaus uh you know back home or we're going back to fishing or we're locked in the in the church with the doors locked and the windows barred yeah. There, there's a time, there's significant time of disorientation and, and a ceasing of activity um, and, and hitting the wall of failure. And, and, and then that leads ultimately to the risen Jesus who comes in and, and our acknowledgement that we're totally reliant and dependent on God's supernatural uh, interaction and empowerment, which then leads to the creation of something new. And in that case, it would be the church, the embodiment of Christ in the world. So the next thing that we would be looking for is like, where are the broken places? And what is God calling us, um, you know, in that loving and serving building relationship space? Um, okay, that's that's really helpful, actually, because I think that that whole thing about some of the stuff that we actually have to unlearn, um, yeah. self-emptying, I think is, yeah at the start of that process is probably really important. Um, so um, Shirley has commented, we've seen lots of people walking in our village and our short works take ages because we are stopped to talk. And, and it just, see, yeah, which is great, isn't it? Um, That's what you want, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah. And then Anna um, in Sweden has just, um, in my parish, encouraged co-workers to walk in our villages to meet people since we can't meet them in other ways. Um, we still invite them to come um, to take a walk for your health together with us. And it's very appreciated. And I, I know, yeah, and it's really interesting, is that whole area of, of taking time and of walking with people changes the dynamic of, yeah. of what happens um, and what, yeah, and what kind of, yeah, what goes on. Um, there's a Japanese, I think he's a Japanese theologian uh, called, uh, let me get this right, Kosuki Koyama, who talks about a three mile an hour God. Um, and I, again, it's just kind of, it just, that sense of slowing down what you've talked about and about, you know, meeting people where they are in their local contexts. Um, actually might be, it, it, and it's as simple as that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Brilliant. So um, just tell me, because um, Stuart has obviously been, Stuart Nixon has been on um, onto Amazon to try and order your book. Um, so where is it available from, um, Michael, if anybody wants to read it? Well, it is on Amazon. So if it's not right now, then it's something that has crashed with the site or something. Okay. So it is on Amazon. Also, Fresh Expressions US actually has it the cheapest if you go on the Fresh Expressions US website. Okay. Uh, and there you can order it in bulk for your team at different discounted rates. Yeah, um, great. Uh, and we, I, if we can maybe post that in the comment section, but it has been on Amazon all this time. So if it's not there, something's happened. Yeah, all right. So we'll do, yeah, we perhaps need, yeah, we probably need to do just some investigating from, uh, from your perspective. Um, and I'll just see if I can find um, the, um, is, that in the, is there a shop on the US site? There is. The Fresh Expressions US site uh, has all of the books there that you can buy directly through them. Under resources? Under store, yeah. I'll, uh, yeah. yep. Yep, it's there. Just I, in the chat. Can, uh, can I reflect on Stuart's um, comment there while you're, while you're getting that? Yeah, sure, uh, go for it. About, um, you know, uh, eavesdropping, feeling a bit dodgy in the uh, uh, the digital space, and we need to tread carefully. And I say amen to that. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of this, what we're talking about today, that does uh, translate to the digital space. And, and one of the things that we're trying to um, teach our pioneers is what does it look like to listen in the digital space? What does it look like to immerse ourselves? And there's a there's a line to toe there, right? Because in an attention economy, these digital devices are are meant to monetize our attention and to to keep us, you know, on our screens, right? Yeah. So is there is there a way we can reverse the algorithm and go into that space in a posture of listening and 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 use um, where where it kind of sets you up to speak what's on your mind? Is there a way we can reverse that and try to find out what's on other people's minds Yep. by asking questions? And is there anything we can pray for you for today? And how do you go into that space knowing the Holy Spirit's already in that digital space and join with the Spirit's doing? And I think that takes what you've been talking about, Tim, is a careful balance of going into the digital space with intentionality, prayerfully forming relationships, listening, but also then times of tech fasting and and um not being in digital space and intentionally withdrawing from that um almost in the way that jesus had this rhythm of advance and retreat of times of lots of high activity and work the disciples are so busy they forget to eat but then with withdrawing back to the mountainside with jesus and spending time so I think that can work in that digital space where we're going in, contextual intelligence, listening, finding out what the needs are, creating yep. digital forms of community for people in that space, um, but then also spending time retreating and, and uh, doing that, um, you know, Sabbath and rest and disconnect from technology. And again, that that is about the kind of the rhythms, isn't it, which we put in place, which, uh, which sustain us 
through yeah. the whole of our kind of ongoing journey and certainly i think kind of lockdown has in many ways has and the covid pandemic has actually begun to highlight some of those lack of rhythms that yes we've 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 you know suddenly a whole group of people have discovered that they they no longer quite as busy as they were and they're looking around and thinking right okay so it was the activity which sustained me and yet yeah. actually, that's not what it's about um there's this yeah kind of almost a a, a rediscovery a re interest in, you know how contemplation works out what that means and what does it mean to be not doing and like you've said the rhythms around sabbathing um seem to be yeah kind of really important um, yeah. so yeah thank you so uh, we just posted um there's the link to the us shop um, michael will perhaps um have a look at um why it is that the um Amazon, um, it may well be that it's just the difference between the US and the UK. It might be just in the UK, but um, yeah, we can. Uh, but if you want to go and buy it from the States, then you can do. Um, and so the links are there for you to be able to to go and uh, to buy that and to, uh, to, to use this. So we're just kind of coming into landing, kind of, kind of. So just I'd encourage if anybody's got any more uh, comments or questions. Um, that they want to put to Michael, uh, I would really encourage you to to put those in um, right now. That would be great. Um, and then, Michael, I know that um, you know you and I have had a number of conversations, and you always talk about the fact that uh, um, we are your, we are the, we are the future. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I just wonder if you know, in terms of kind of where we are as a kind of a movement here in the UK. Um, do you have a kind of a word of encouragement to us um, in terms of kind of where we're at and what's kind of going on at the moment? You and I have talked a little bit about some of that stuff, but um, what, what is it? Do you have something that you, you know, in particular that you perhaps would just like to say um, um, kind of to the wider um, Fresh Expressions movement here in the UK at this point in time? Um. I would just encourage you and celebrate you and uh, that we, we do know that you are from our future and the, the impact of these um, sometimes, you know, seemingly small little things that, that you all have going, that they have a, an impact beyond your local context. And over on this side of the pond, we're learning from you. Uh, we're doing our best to try to uh, hopefully uh, short, short, circuit shortcut a little bit of our failure um, <laughs> and try to see uh, the forest before the trees and and make these adaptations i think i i do realize that um as far as post christendom and secularization all those things that you are are, are significantly in front of us on that and so um if, if we can in, in the u.s try to really make this mixed economy blended ecology work now before we get that far down there it could it could have a different kind of uh, outcome outcome yeah. so i just i encourage you all that um, it is brilliant what you're doing and and please keep it up and there's lots of us over here learning um and i know as a as a pioneer who nine out of the ten things that we try fail um but but then we always tell the story of the one thing that yeah. that made it right well there was nine things that failed to get to that and i think the only real failure is is when we don't learn from our failures yeah um and so it's just i think that's what learning is is a process of failing forward yeah right thank you um, so Stuart's asked uh, what do you see are the biggest challenges and opportunities um for pioneering when we when we come out of lockdown mm, that's good good question Stuart, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would love to hear what you have on this, Tim. The the first thing I would say is um, what I start seeing to happen is people just trying to get back to normal, and and in a sense um, leaving behind a lot of learnings and experimentation and innovation that's happened over the past year. Uh, and I think it would be really sad if we just went back 
to the way things were before the pandemic because as horrific and challenging as the pandemic has been it's also been just this profound reset yeah um, and and it's forced us into the space of missional innovation and all of that so i think the greatest challenge is going to be sustaining the balance um i don't think it's a problem to be solved but attention to be managed of analog digital um continuing those new expressions in the digital space and without leaving behind um, our in-person flesh and blood and doing those both kind of equally. Great. Um, so I think for me, um, my great, I think the greatest challenge that we will face is speeding up again and forgetting to walk through our neighborhoods. Mm. And, and I also mean that in terms of, you know, the, the of getting, of just becoming busier again, whatever that might be and whatever that looks like. And then the whole prayer, taking time to reflect, just goes out of the window because we think that activism is what we should be doing. And I'm, and yeah, I think, and so, the, the, you know, trying to redress that balance, I think is a brilliant opportunity for us. And to reestablish some rhythms and some habits and some disciplines, um, which actually will really um, nourish us and feed us for the next part of the journey. Um, and I think, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I think it's quite an exciting time um, because I think the opportunities out there far outweigh the challenges, if I'm perfectly honest, and because actually I don't want to... The resources is an issue, yes, I would agree with that. But I believe in a God of abundance. And I think that is, you know, when I think about some of the church in, you know, in China, Iraq, when I think about the, you know, the early church, it, it didn't rely on the buildings. It just had low resources. And they changed the world. Well, <laughs> that's, those are the, those are the opportunities. Those are the things I would rather I'd rather spend my time chasing and focusing on um, than, yeah, the kind of the challenges. I think that, I think there are some acute challenges for us, but I, yeah, I don't believe in a god of scarcity. I believe in a god of abundance, which I think you've you talked about as well. Um, yeah. So I think that's yeah, for me that's that's really important, and also create the the sense of di there are creating some different narratives um out there um so yeah thanks to for that question um hope that was um um kind of helpful for you um so yeah so we've just got a couple of minutes left michael it would be great to pray for you thank you for your kind of um your kind of contribution today i've really enjoyed it um so what what could we pray for you um, well contacts now yeah i appreciate that and could i could i ask a question of our group that's here gathered and you tim um for us in the us as we're we're kind of like toddlers in this movement and we're just feeling our way around trying to get on our feet a little bit um what would you all tell us across the pond um if, if you could if you could communicate to us as we're just getting this started from our future yeah um, what what could we what should we not do maybe uh, what what learnings what encouragement would you give us um, I would love to hear anybody in the group and especially you Tim give us some wisdom on yeah, that. If folks want to put their comments um, about that into that into the chat box that would be yeah that would be great Michael would really appreciate that um, for me um, I think I probably want to say. Um, if you go together in genuine partnership, you'll learn far more on the journey. So I think for us, one of the most, you know, one of the 
crucial things is our ability to be able to to journey together to learn from each other in our different contexts so whether that be in you know the different denominational contexts um the learning that we gather from that and as a consequence of that uh, what we bring to the table then and have those conversations in an ecumenical way i think is richer far far richer than what we might discover apart so creating the space for that ecumenical conversation to happen i think is crucial um i suppose our our context here in the uk might lend us to being able to do that um better um because we're we're smaller um so i think that that for me but i also think the whole aspect of small missional local contexts and communities have the power to change the world and i think that's i think that's where it's going i think that's what's happening um so so langley um i know langley from uh in peterborough really lovely to hear from you langley um bless you um a spirit uh help people to focus on a spiritual rhythm uh, through live stream and paper resources uh helped us to focus on who and what church is for that's really interesting um but also uh, we need to value online church communities and see them as legitimate i would completely agree with you langley i think that's a whole new kind of ball game which is out there at the moment uh, which um yeah we need to we need to work through um so thank you for that it's really helpful um yeah which of these resources do we maintain when we return to church buildings um, yeah some good good questions there or some good observations um, and james thank you uh, great to hear from you things that glitter may and do attract us initially but they always leave more mess than they think they will well lucy and the messy church guys might uh, disagree with you about uh, yeah <laughs> glitter being a pain to clear up yes it is but boy do you have some fun when you get creative with glitter <laughs> pay less attention to the glitter and more to the offering people the chance to know the character of jesus as you modeled him uh, yeah interesting yeah. glitters is not gold i think that's probably true but um yeah sometimes we need to splash a little bit of glitter around to uh, to help people engage brilliant okay well if uh, if anybody's right we'll just catch up with those um as we kind of go but we're just gonna kind of bring our time to a close so let's just let's just pray for for uh for those who've been listening and also for for michael um in his context as well father god we thank you for our time um yes. together um today thank you uh, for michael and for the wisdom which he has brought to us uh, from across the pond thank you uh, that the text worked and that uh, we can indeed uh, connect with the wisdom um, and we ask lord that you will continue to guide um, the fresh expressions movement here in the uk and across in the states too our heart is to see more people come to know who jesus is to bow the knee yes. and to follow jesus and to know what it is to live with him in their lives father we ask that you would help us uh, to do that uh, bless um, all those folks who have been listening the contexts in which they are in uh, lord i ask that you would be uh, help them to to listen to what your spirit is saying uh, and to join in with that holy spirit yes. and we ask all these things in and through the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen 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 Brilliant. Um, so um, this um, will be available for people to uh, to watch again or to listen to uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, and also um, tomorrow um, at uh, 12.30, you hopefully will have seen uh, the publicity on social media, but the whole rewilding conversation will be continuing. So uh, Lizzie will be here uh, and she'll be talking about that and uh with paul bradfrey and tina hodgett two brilliant pioneers 
who uh, are really good at thinking stuff through. So if you're around and can join in with that conversation, then I'm sure uh, that will be a really cracking conversation. Uh, so thank you, guys. Great to uh, be part of you. Thanks for the questions and the comments that you put in the chat box. Really appreciate it. And uh, God bless you for the next part of the journey. Take care. Thanks, everyone.